Hey, I want you to turn in your Bible to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm not going to be real long because I, we're going to share a moment of communion together, but um, it, this is a very, very vital and important message. Um, and if, you know, we're given it a title, the title would be The Exchange, The Exchange. That's the, the thought I want to leave you with today is The Exchange. And, um, and, and it kind of comes from uh, if last fall, Kayla and I were in Europe. We had had a, a kind of a missions trip there, and we were seeing a couple sites with the days that we had left. And, um, and when you're in Europe, there are just so many opportunities to visit so many countries. And, and so, um, we, you know, we're zigzagging through as many as we can. And one of the realities of when you go to another country is that there is a currency exchange rate that takes place. And so, you know, every country has a different currency, and they're not all created equal. And so you go in one, um, you know, with a certain amount, and you leave with a different amount. Um, for instance, you know, the, a one U.S. dollar here at the time we were there was only about 60 cents in equivalency to the euro. And so you're constantly kind of mining uh, the, this, this, you know, exchange rate. And so it kind of, you know, sparked some curiosity in my mind. And I just, I just kind of was curious. I wonder where I could get the most bang for the buck. Um, but what country has the best exchange rate for the U.S. dollar? And so I did some research. And at the time that I looked it up, um, that country was Zimbabwe, the African nation of Zimbabwe. And, um, and here's the thing. One U.S. dollar equaled or exchanged to 200 250 trillion Zimbabwe dollars at the time. So one U.S. dollar ended up becoming 250 trillion Zimbabwe dollars. They look at your neighbor and say, I got a plane to catch, right? I mean, like all of a sudden, you think you don't have enough. You've got plenty. You just have to move to Zimbabwe. Now, here's the thing. I, I don't know a lot about the nation. Um, I'm sure it's full of beautiful people and beautiful sights, but it did get me thinking about moving there because you, you can just imagine the difference. Like, here, you're on the dollar menu. There, you own the restaurant, right? I mean, it's, it's a major. Here, you, you got to save for vacation. You move to Zimbabwe, you're going to live on vacation. You know, here, I'm like regular Joe here. Yeah, I go there, I'm going to be royalty, pomp and circumstance everywhere I go, all kinds of, you know, this is going to be a big deal. And it just got me thinking, it's funny how in one place, you can be barely making it, and in another place, you can be beyond blessed, in one place, you can, I mean, you can barely be getting life, through life. And in another place, you can live like royalty. It's funny the effect that an exchange has on one's quality of life. And that's what I want to talk to you today is I want to talk to you for the next, just the next few moments about a place of exchange. About a place of exchange where, where all of your guilt can be exchanged for grace. A place of exchange where, where your, your losses in life can actually be exchanged for victories. Where, where your weak faith can be exchanged into an immovable strong faith. And, and the place that I'm referring to is the cross. Now, here's the thing that we have to realize, though. Unfortunately, for us, the cross has become very familiar and that's really the challenge that I have today is getting you to see it in a new way. Because the reality is, as you drove in, you probably saw one on the side of a building. You may have seen one by a highway. I mean, the cross is so common, you may be wearing one around your neck at this moment. Which the irony of that is kind of funny. It shows you how much the cross has become common because in Jesus' day, this was a form of execution. And today, it's just something you wear around your neck. You know, I mean, maybe in a hundred or so years from now, people wear electric chairs around their neck, you know? It, there's just something that happens where the cross becomes familiar. It becomes so common in our lives. If I was to ask the average person, what's the significance of the cross? Well, most people would say, well, you know, if you really boil it down, that's, I mean, that's where Jesus died. And that is true, but that barely scratches the surface to what the cross actually makes available. See, the cross is not simply where Jesus died. The cross itself is where God displayed his love forever so that no one could ever question if he loves you. It is not an opinion. It is a historical fact. The cross is where God's highest holy standard was met without having to lower his standards to our standards. The cross is the literal place where death was buried. The, 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 these beams have the capability to rebuild even the most broken, 
broken life. The nails that held Jesus to the cross now hold the consequences of sin at bay so that it cannot ruin your life. The cross is not common. It's not familiar. The cross literally was the game changer for all of human history. It's at the cross that one side is B.C. and it's at the cross that the other side is A.D. So foundational is the cross that it changed the course. It defeated hell, death, and the grave for all. It it establishes life abundantly for all. The cross changed the course of your life and you may not even recognize it because it's become familiar. And so my challenge today is to help you to see the cross in a new way because the cross has done all of that. And yet many of us live as though it was just a historical fact or a symbol. I I think of the years that I saw the cross as simply a, a religious symbol. And those years were accompanied by fighting fights I didn't have to fight. Those years were accompanied by carrying, um, having a lack of peace and a lack of joy that was always due me. As long as I looked at the cross as a symbol, I never saw its supernatural ability to release to my life. And you need to know that about your life. That as long as this is common, it no longer carries the power to transform your life. So today I I, want to take off the commonness of the cross and and the familiarity of just what you know. I I don't want this any longer to just be, you know, a display or a decoration or, or even just a moment in human history. The cross has to become a reality, not just for one day when you laid down your guilt, but for every day because you need to load up on grace. See, there's so many people that have experienced the cross as one moment, but they don't realize that they can live in light of the cross and live in total victory because it's provided. And so today, I I, I want to help you see the cross in a different way. I want you you to see it not as familiar, but as relevant, not as historical, but as what you need to live in the moment and the victory that God has. Because as long as you see the cross as common, you'll always live below what God has for you. See, the cross is not something that's distant in a history book. It is the solutions for your struggles that you face today. And so I want to help you with that because the cross does something unique. The cross was when God stepped into human history, outside of eternity, and stepped into human history and, and offered to exchange our worst for his best. That, that it's the moment when God himself decided, I will, I will step through and for once let humanity see me and let them see my intent as everything that's messed up in your life, I can make right with this exchange. And so you may not even realize the exchanges that God is offering you, but at the cross continues 2,000 years later to offer to exchange the things that you don't want in life and to give you the things that you've always wanted in life. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the five exchanges that the cross offers. Now, here's what I would say to you. Um, I love when I inspire you. I love when I motivate you. I enjoy making you laugh. But today's message, even though it's short, you need to realize that this could be life-changing. And so I want to encourage you to take out your sermon notes, to, to take out your phone and open up the note sheet there. Or even if you've got to make a makeshift pair of notes on the back of a prayer card, I don't want you to miss the exchanges that are offered. Because though this sermon will end the offer of exchanging the worst in your life for the best God has to offer, stands for eternity. And I don't want you to forget it. So here, here's the first one. The first one is this. Um, these, these are the, the cross exchanges Number one, our sinfulness for his righteousness. Our sinfulness for his righteousness. Now, it was some time ago that um, uh, Thawyer, our oldest, was just having a tough week. Uh, I don't know. Um, he, he just, you know, was kind of just acting a little crazy. Your kids ever act crazy? Like, just sometimes they're so good, and then all of a sudden it's just like they eat something or something, you know, a fl- a switch is flipped, and they just act so different. Well, he was in the middle. I mean, he was just so mean-spirited and, and just, just kind of just sassy. And I mean, like, he, he was just, um, well, he's acting like his mama. You know what I'm talking about. You know, it just, it just was, I, I don't know what's wrong with <laughs> Obviously, I'm kidding, um, and, and, and I'm the sassy one. You know that, you know, and, but, but it, it, Sawyer's just having a tough couple of days, and he, it was three days of quit that, stop that, you do that one more time, and you're going to, you know, just, you know how it is, and, and, um, and I noticed by about day three of just kind of constant struggle that I just didn't notice him hanging out with us. 
you know, as a family, I didn't see him. And so I went upstairs, and I found him, um, and I found him in his room. And he had the door shut, and I walked in, and he was sitting on his bed. And I could tell he was, he was, he was upset. As a matter of fact, I could tell because his eyes were a little red where he had been crying. And so I came in, and I sat down beside him. I said, hey, buddy, what's going on? And he said, uh, he said Dad, I'm a bad kid, and all I do is bad. And my heart, the heart of a dad, just went out to his son because he'd been in so many so much trouble and many mess ups that all of a sudden it just it's like it started getting on the inside of him it's the way he saw himself and so I, I, I just all of a sudden I said Sawyer that's not the way I see you buddy I said um, I just want you to know I see you're a great big brother and you, you have such a, a sweet spirit about you and you have a, a pure heart and you're, you're just so you're just such a good boy and I, I just I know you've had a, a tough week but I just want you to listen to me Sawyer you are my son, and I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. And, and all of a sudden, you could see a dynamic happen. When Sawyer stopped seeing himself through his own eyes and instead saw himself through his father's eyes, it's like something washed over him. Like all of a sudden, the, the struggle and the despondency and the self-hate and the and I can't, it just got washed away with the words of his dad. And, and so I want to read you in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Paul writes, For God took the sinless Christ, sinless Christ, and poured into him our sins. Then in exchange, everybody say in exchange. He poured God's goodness into us. So here's what happened on the cross. God collected all of the sins of mankind. Your sins, my sins, all of the sin. And he transferred them on to Jesus. But that's not where he stopped. He also transformed all of Jesus' right living and put it onto us. So do you know what that means? Do you know how your heavenly father sees you? When your heavenly father looks at you, he does not see the mess ups, the mistakes, and the sin. When your heavenly father looks through the, the eyes of eternity at your life, he doesn't see you, he sees Jesus. Listen, he, he doesn't see, you are literally, when you're in Christ, you're hidden behind the cross and all it represents. God doesn't look down and see all the mess ups. He doesn't look all to see all the failures. He doesn't see how you can't get it together. You know what he sees? The perfect work of Jesus on the cross. Listen, when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see your bad. He sees Jesus as good. He doesn't see your wrong. He sees what Jesus made right. Listen, what literally happened on the cross is that God took your sinful record and exchanged it for Jesus' priceless and pure reputation. So here's my question. <laughs> then why are you still punishing yourself for something God's already forgiven you for? Why are you still carrying guilt for something God doesn't even see in your life? Why would you continue to remember failures that God himself has already forgotten? Listen, God is all-knowing, which means when he forgets something, he intentionally forgets it, not by accident. And God has intentionally forgotten your sin. He exchanged all that was wrong with us for everything that was right with Jesus, why in the world would you live as though you have to prove yourself to a God who has demonstrated he loves you in an immeasurable way? So the first one is, is that it exchanges our sinfulness for his righteousness. Here, here's the second one. Um, the cross exchanges our struggle for his freedom. Now, now listen, the wonderful thing about the cross is not only does it forgive sin, it frees us from sin. So, so Paul wrote about it this way in Romans 6. He said, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We know we're no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free. There was an exchange from the power of sin. Now, l l let me say, so many people live forgiven of sin but not free from sin. And, and they've not exchanged it. And here's how I, I would explain it. I saw a pastor do this years ago, and it, and it so helped me. I want, I want to help you. Let's, um, your heart is set from the moment you take your first breath on sin. You're born with a sin nature. 
Like, we didn't have to teach you to be selfish. We didn't have to teach you to, to say what you say. When nobody had to pull you aside and say, listen, this is how you act out. This is how you get anger. You nat you're a natural at that. And, and, and what happens is, is that what you don't realize is, is that sin nature in our hearts, it's like the GPS of our hearts was already set on the destination for sin. We didn't even have to try. As a matter of fact, what, what truly is said is that your sinful, your, your GPS of your heart, it's actually set on the direction of hell. Now, now today, for just this, this is going to be hell. You guys set in hell today, so sorry about that. And then, then this is going to be heaven. This is going to represent what God wants. This is going to represent what the sinful nature wants. Now, what happens is, is that your heart is naturally set on this. And so you pursue it. You pursue what you want, when you want, however you want. But there comes a day, for some of you, um, you know, it comes with age, and for some it comes with a spiritual revelation, that you start to realize this direction is not life-giving. You start to realize, you know what, dating this kind of person is not going to bring about what I want. Doing this kind of thing is not going to give me the life I want. This is not what God wants for my life. You start to figure it out. And so do you know what most people do? They try to change direction. And they do it by trying harder. I'm going to keep the rules I'm going to live up to God's standard. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to try hard. I, I'm not, I'm not going to be around them as much. I, I'm not going to go there any often. I, I'm not going to say that anymore. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and you try and you try and try. Now, here's the problem with trying. It wears you out. And what happens is all this trying eventually wears you out, and eventually you, you say, I can't do this anymore. And you know what happens? All this pressure that you've been trying, 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 boom, goes right back the way it used to be. Do you know why? Because... Um, you can have good seasons where you try, but you can never sustain it. You can have moments where you do right, but you can't keep it right. You, you can have days where you don't say it, but then you, it comes back and you keep saying it. And you try and you try, but you, and so you just get really frustrated at some point. You go, God, I thought I, you know, I, I want to live for you, but it just seems like everything I want is not for you. And I can't tell you how many years I lived like that, trying to keep the rules, trying to do the right thing, trying to say the right thing, trying to think the right way. And it's just pressure, 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 and I always ended up worse than I was before. And, and he, he, here's what happens is there gets a point where you realize you can't do it. That's what happened is one day I just said, God, I've tried to attend. I've tried to think right. I've tried to, I've done, I've done all the rules. I've done, and, and it just always keeps going back. God, I can't do this. If you don't do it, then it can't be done. And you know what God did? Okay, good. <laughs> he reached out of my heart and rewired my heart in a moment to where I don't even want what I used to want. Now I want what he wants. Like, but he had to let me exchange my trying for surrender. And so, so for some of you today... You, you attend, life group, serve, school of leadership, do everything. I've invited 67 people to Easter. I'm trying, 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 but it's not working. And today, at the end of the service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to say, God, I can't do this on my own. And you know what God's going to do? He's going to reach down in your heart and he's going to go, okay, I'll do it. And all of a sudden, your heart will be rewired and you'll want what he wants. There are some of you that if this has happened and you can't even imagine wanting the old life you used to desperately want. Like there's some of you are like, I used to want that. I can't believe I wanted that. I can't believe I used to act like that. I can't believe I used to say that. I can't believe that's the kind of man I used to want today. I mean, that is crazy because he so changed your wanter by reaching in and exchanging your brokenness for his freedom. Now, some of you are saying, well, this didn't happen in my life yet. It's not happened in my life. Why, you know, I, I'm serving Christ, but I still want all this. Well, here's what happens. What happens in your spirit is one thing, but then it's your responsibility to catch your mind up to what God's done in your spirit. And you know the only way you change your mind is by spending time with God every day. Do you know what Jesus said? Jesus said this. He said, daily carry your You know what that means? Some of you have picked it up one time at a prayer moment, and you walked a few days with it, but then you set it back down, and that's why you went back into your sinful nature. For, for some of you, you picked it up at a camp one time and you enjoyed that season, but then you set it back down and you went right back into what you used. He says, daily carry your cross. Daily come to the cross. Daily stand up and say, God, I can't do this. I, I'm, not, I'm not big enough and strong enough. Even though I'm with you, I'm not big enough. And strong. I need you to clean me up. I need you to build me up. God, I need you today. Here, here's what I've discovered. Any sin habit can be destructed by a prayer habit because when you sit down to pray, the, you're, you're in the shadow of the cross and the power of the cross is released in your life. 
You'll struggle your whole life until you get to the place where every day you go, God, I've got to have the power of the cross, and I'm going to spend time with you to let you come, come in and rechange my heart. And before long, you'll find, wow, I'm a completely different person because I've, I've carried my cross daily. So for some of you, you know, the, the moment's great, but tomorrow morning's when you need to show up to the cross. Tuesday's when you need to, before the meeting, show up to the cross. Because you don't, don't set it down today. I'm, I'm going to make sure you leave with it today. But pick it up and carry it with you day after day and watch and see how he won't exchange your struggle for his freedom. Now, now here, here, here's the third one. The third one's this. He'll exchange our brokenness for his healing. Um, in the book of Isaiah, which was written 700 or several hundred years before Jesus actually went to the cross, there was kind of this prophetic picture that, that got to see into the future, but it got to see the spiritual implications of what Jesus' cross would do for us. And it's Isaiah 53, 5. Here's what it says. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his physical wounds, we are physically healed. That's what this means. So this is a poetic picture of the most gruesome experience a human being has ever had. Because you have to remember, Jesus didn't just hang on a cross. He wasn't just nailed to a cross. Before he went to the cross, they brought him into a, a, a special headquarters for the Roman dispatch, and they, they, they tied him to a whipping post. And the Bible says they struck him with their hands, they struck him with rods, but particularly they used something called a cat of nine tails. It was a form of a short whip, and it had little pieces of bone and iron in it so that when it was swung, it would stick to the person that they struck, and then when they pulled back, it would pull flesh off of them. So, so, so literally, they would swing it, it would stick, and they would pull flesh off. But you know what? <laughs> you realize what the Romans didn't realize in that moment, right? Is every time they swung it onto him, and every time they ripped flesh off, they put healing on us. Literally, every time they beat him, they blessed us. And, and some people say, why, why, how could Jesus, I mean, he doesn't flinch to go through this. He doesn't try to, try to get out of it. At no point does he take on his, his divinity and say, that's it, I'm stopping this craziness. Do you know Jesus just stays focused? And I've determined that the reason Jesus stays focused all the way through this pain is because Jesus realizes what's being gained at his loss. Every time that whip cracked, he went, there goes diabetes. Every time that whip cracked, he goes, there goes cancer. Every time that whip cracked, he goes, now no one has to have my anymore then every time they swung it they pulled blessing off of him and placed it onto us every time they hit him it healed us and so all of a sudden you start to see that God offers you an exchange if you're here today in, in physical torment struggle there's an exchange he's willing to, to heal what's hurting in you and here, here's what I've kind of determined um, when we don't pray for healing we minimize the price Jesus paid on the cross. Now, listen, I'm all for medicine. I really am. We got cabinets full of it. Um, we take our kids to doctors. So I, I got no, uh, God will use medicine or miracle. He, does, uh, he wants you to be healthy, and he'll use both. Um, but what he does care about is where we go first. And, and what I realized in my life several years ago is, is that I went to doctors and medicine cabinets first instead of to the one who, who paid and was willing to exchange my divine healing. And so for today, we, we really have read a habit where if we're struggling, with somebody's sick, the kids, and they're always sick. I mean, it's like little Petri dishes running around. I mean, they're always got something. We're going to pray before we go to a doctor. We're going to pray before we go to the medicine cabinet. Here's why. Because if Jesus paid for it, why wouldn't we enjoy it? Let, let me say it this way. Um, I could tell you countless stories of big things God has healed in my physical body, in Kayla's physical body. This room's filled with people who tell you. I'm going to intentionally tell you a small story. Just a couple weeks ago, Kayla came to, to me and she said, my, this headache, she said, it's awful. I just got a terrible headache. I want to shut the blinds. I need, you know, just a terrible headache. And it was ruining her day. And all of a sudden, I, I, th I, I thought, well, I'll, just, I'll get her some, some Advil or something. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit gave me a quick picture of the crown of thorns Jesus wore. And it was just his way of going, why don't you see if I could do it first? 
And so I, I went over and said, baby, let's pray for this. And, and we just, a simple prayer. God, we, you know, you, you on the cross provided all that we need. Um, we're claiming this physical healing for Kayla in Jesus' name. Amen. That was it. Within seconds, it was gone. Within seconds, all of a sudden she could open the window. She was, and it didn't come back. It wasn't, she hadn't taken it. Within seconds, it was transformed. And we've just determined that if Jesus was going to endure the pain, we're going to enjoy the, the, the promise. And that's what, for some of you today, God is going to heal you in communion. He's going to heal chronic pain. He's going to heal arthritis. He's going to heal diabetes. He's going to heal you because for the first time, you're willing to say, you know what, God? I'm tired of carrying this myself. Will you exchange this for me today? Now, now, let me give you another one. Number four, um, our relational problems for his relational peace. See, here's the thing. You say, what's the cross got to do with my relationships? The cross was not only so you could be at peace with God. It was also so that you could be at peace with other people. Here, I'll show it to you. 2 Corinthians 5, 18. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ on the cross. And he didn't just do a reconciliation. He then turns around and says, hey, um, I'm going to give you the ministry of reconciliation. So here's what, what he's saying is, is that when God reconciled the most broken relationship between you and him, when Jesus made right the most broken relationship between you and him, he not only made it right, but then he turned around and said, now I'm going to give you the power or the ministry to make your relationships right. So, so let, let me say that you say, well, how, how is that? I mean, the person I know is really difficult. I bet they're not more difficult than you were. L let me say it this way. How, how, do you, how do you do this? You can give what you've received. That's how you, you can release the power of reconciliation. You just give what you receive. Let, let, let me ask you, has, has, has God ever listened to you? You just, I mean, you, you've, just wave at me if he's ever listened to you. God's just listened to you, okay? Has, has God, uh, let me ask you this, has God ever encouraged you? Yes. Okay, so he's encouraged you. Okay. In your relationship with God, has he ever sacrificed for you? Okay. Um, let me ask you this. In your relationship for God, did he humble himself? The Bible says he got off his throne and put on this old ruggedy flesh, and, and he did that so he would humble himself to serve you. So he's done that for you. Let me ask you this. Has God in your relationship, just you and him, has he forgiven you? Well, then if he's done that, if he's listened to you, then you've got the power to listen to somebody else. If, 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 if he's... If he's encouraged you, you have the power inside of you to encourage that person. Listen, if he's sacrificed for you, guess what? You have the power to sacrifice for them. If he's humbled himself for you, you have the ability to push away stubborn pride that's keeping a relationship broken, and you have the power to make it right. If he's forgiven you, you have the power to forgive them. Do you, let me say it this way, Jesus has given you everything you need to make any relationship right. Then, then why do believers stay in bad relationships? I think a lot of believers stay in bad relationships because they pray for bad relationships instead of exercise the power they've given to mend bad relationships. Now, prayer is important, but God didn't give you a prayer life to fix relationships. He gave you power to fix relationships. And, and, and I, 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 prayer, you got, you got to pray couple, you got to pray business owner, you got to, I mean, you got to pray, but listen, you've been given power to already make it right. You know what that means? You don't need to pray they change, you need to put away pride, step out and encourage them and start the conversation again. You don't need to pray that something in them gets right. You need to apologize for what you did. You, you don't need to pray that something works out and God waves a magic wand over them. You know what you need to do? You need to go and restart the conversation that you shut down. You need to go and forgive. You need to go and love. Love is the most powerful force on the universe. The Bible says that love is the one thing that will not fail. When put into a relationship, love cannot fail. It also says that of all the things we see in this world, they will all pass away. But you know what? won't love love is eternal so you have the most powerful and the internal source that you can put love into any relationship you can serve them you can be kind to them you can encourage them and you're not just doing it what you're doing is taking the power of the cross and letting it go active into that relationship and what scripture says is that no relationship can resist the power of love to make it right again
Listen, you don't need to pray about it. You just need to go and take the step and exercise the power you've already been given to make it right. You can make every relationship you have in your life better today. You can start God's work with a text. You can make it better today because God's exchanged that power. Here's the last one. Um, He'll exchange our shame for his acceptance. Um, Often when we look at the cross, we get caught up in its brutality. You know, the, the beating Jesus took and the, 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 the pain in his body. But if you were to ask Jesus the worst part of the cross, he would not tell you it was the nails. He would not tell you it was the, the barbs that went in his back. He would not tell you it was the beating before. Jesus would not say the physical um, endurement of the cross was the worst. Jesus said, you want to know what was the worst part of the cross? The shame. Because while Jesus hung on the cross, our shame hung on him. All the shame that comes from sin, all the shame that comes from the the night after, all the shame that comes from doing the wrong thing, all the shame got hung on Jesus. And, And the Bible records that the only time, see, when Jesus talked about his heavenly father, he always referred to him as father. Like, like all, if you talk to Jesus about God, he didn't say God. He said, Father. Do you know my Father? Let me tell you about my Father. When you pray, say, Our Father. And constantly, Father. You know the only time that Jesus ever did not call God Heavenly Father was when he was hanging on the cross and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You, you know why? Because shame is so powerful, it can separate you from your Heavenly Father. It did it in Jesus' life, and it's doing it in many of your lives. There are some of you who walked in here today, and you look fine, you worship, you mouth the words, but in the inside of you, there's shame. And that shame has put a great distance between you and God. And you've went through the exercises of faith, but it's been a long time since you had an experience with God. And it's because of shame. Shame resides in our lives for two reasons. Usually, number one is because of something we did. And so we start saying to ourselves, well, uh, you know, there's a voice that's always willing to tell us, because of what you did, God can never forgive you. God sees what you did, and he's not forgotten it. Because what you've done, you're not just wrong in that moment. You're wrong. Something about you is not right. That voice is always so. Second reason you may have shame is not because of something you did, but something that was done to you. Some of you are abused. Some of you came through terrible situations. Some, some of it wasn't your fault, but you were the blunt uh, end of the, pro, the, 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 the of what happened. And, and you sit here today, and, and that voice tells you, it says to you, um, that, that you're damaged goods. That there's something about you that will never be right for what they did. That, that you're dirty. That, that, that because at the hand of someone else, there is something permanently been undone in your life. Now, here, here's what I want you to know. Those feelings are real, but they are not true. Your feelings can be real and not true at the same time. And I'll show you. Uh, Ephesians 2.13, it says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, there was once a separation, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. There was an exchange. At once you were at distance for what happened to you or what you did, but not after the cross. And and, and here's what you have to understand. Jesus organized everything about the cross. He he organized to make sure that he, he would come at a time in human history that execution was at its absolute worst. He didn't want there ever to be a time where people go, well, if he, he would have had to endure this. He came at its worst. He came at the perfect time, and he also orchestrated that he would not only be physically abused, but that he would be completely humiliated. Jesus was hung naked for all public display in the middle of a, 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 a very busy thoroughfare. Jesus endured a public humiliation so you never have to hide in shame. Jesus received countless insults so that you never have to live without his encouragement. Jesus faced constant ridicule so that you never again would have to live rejected in your life. 
And when that voice comes and says, shame on you, Jesus made sure that you understood it's not shame on you, it's your shame on me. That I will make sure this cross blunts the voice that ever says you're not good enough and it echoes God's voice that says, you are loved, you are my daughter, you are my son. There is nothing about you wrong. I made you perfectly and everything that's been done to you or that you've ever done can't compare to the love that I have for you. My love is limitless. My love cannot be measured in the way that it has for you. You are not rejected. You are accepted. You are not broken. You are blessed. You are not messed up. You are mine, and I'll choose you any day of the week. He's saying, I'll take that shame, and I'll give you acceptance to where you don't live any longer thinking you don't have a heavenly father. He said, well, why does he offer all that, and I don't have it? I'll show you. Hebrews 10, 14. But that single offering, the cross, he, Jesus, did everything that needed to be done. You know what that just said? Everything you need for your life, emotionally, physically, everything you need for your life, spiritually, everything you need for your life, relationally, Jesus fixed at the cross. The cross is not a historical monument. It was God's solution to everything that was broken in this world. Everything needed to be done. For everyone who takes part, did you know that God can provide things that you never take part in? It's like being in, in one of these rewards programs. You sign up for it, but you never use the miles. You sign up for it, but you never take the discount. You're a part of it, but you're not participating in it. And he says, I've taken care of all through the cross for those who take part. Say, so, well, how do I take part then? Here's what I've learned. Um, God cannot exchange what you won't release. God will not exchange what you won't release. There was a, a story I heard one time of a five-year-old girl who was at a store with her mother, and um, she found this co uh, costume jewelry, a set of, of, of like fake pearls, you know, just, just cheap stuff. And she begged her mom for these, these pearls, begged her mother. I mean, pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. Her mom, like most of us, we don't need more junk in our house. No, we don't need it. And then finally, she, she just gave in and said, okay, fine, and she bought them. And that little girl loved those pearls. I mean, loved them. She wore them nonstop, every outfit. She wore them to school. She wore them to bed. She wore them in, at bath time. She wore those pearls constantly. Loved these little cheap things. Well, her dad had taken notice how much she loves these pearls. And so a few, few, few days had passed, and he walks in one evening to put her to bed, and he says, hey, baby, he says, do you love daddy? And she says, daddy, you know I love you. And he says, okay, then can I have your pearls? And, um, and, and, and she said, oh, daddy, I love these pearls so much. H how about this? You can have my coloring books. And he said, that's okay, sweetie. He kissed her on the head and put her to sleep. A couple more days pass, he comes in to put her to bed again, and he says, hey, baby, um, um, do you love daddy? And she says, oh, you know I love you. And he said, well, then can I have those pearls? Can I have them? She said, oh, Dad, I love these. How about you have my doll? You can have my doll. And um, he says, ah, it's okay, baby. And he kisses her on the, the forehead, and he goes back out. A few more days pass, and he's put her to bed. And uh, he's walked out the door, but all of a sudden, those two little five-year-old feet hit the ground. And they come out and tug on the back of his shirt. And he turns around and he sees his daughter there. And, and her fist is balled up. And outside the sides of the fist are those pearls. And, he, and, and she opens her hand and offers those pearls to her dad. She said, Daddy, I love you. And a big smile breaks out on her dad's face. And he gets down on one knee to look at her eye to eye. And he reaches in his back pocket and he pulls out a velvet bag. And, and then he opens the velvet bag and pulls out an authentic set of pearls. Like very, very expensive, a beautiful gift, a lifetime gift. He pulls them out, and he said, baby, the moment I saw how much you loved those, I got these for you. And, but, but he said to her, he said, but I was just waiting for you to let me exchange what you have for something better. And I just think that's what the Holy Spirit's doing in the heart of people here today. <laughs> He's got a big smile on his face because he thinks for the first time you're willing to open your hand and say, I'm, I'm willing to let you exchange this pain for something better. I'm willing to let you exchange this shame for something better. 
I, I, I'm willing to let you for the first time. I, I've guarded my health so much. I'm going to give it to you, God, and I'm going to let you exchange it for something better. 